guy who's been yelling at you to come back to the theater now has been given my phone. What do you want me to do, Joe? Scoot over a little bit. Scoot over a bit? Okay. Hey, you're on camera now. <laughs> And uh, to close off, we had a 
uh, sort of evaluations and user studies, uh, including a belief entry component. So we have a role choices that all the players had for the game. Uh, we studied that and did interviews. Uh, but we also added some uh, <coughs> game-based elements of uh, having the people playing the striking game uh, really input the knowledge that they gained. So we wanted a very discrete assessment, you know, mostly driven by uh, SSDs from BTS, as well as a show-off game at the end where you had sort of a cultural uh, multiple choice test, question test, that really dug into, did you understand the differences that were in this culture? And with that, I will end and turn it over to the next speaker. which is a uh, very small, very simple JavaScript library, and uh, it turns out also programming language. Um, does anybody not know Tracery in this room? A couple people, okay. Yeah, it's just a, a very simple templating language. Um, it had a very interesting history in that I made it for a class assignment where uh, Michael Matias assigned us to do a pencil and paper grammar, and I had been in his class eight years before that where he had assigned us to do the same assignment, and I decided like twice was too much, so I made this a uh, little JavaScript tool, um, which I then got 110% on, uh, <laughs> open sourced it, and it became the hottest bot making tool currently operating on the internet. Um, so that was pretty solid for an assignment. Um, so uh, Tracery did a lot of things very well, um, not by any grace of my own, but because of some things that I accidentally did. Uh, it was very small, it was very self-contained, um, it did not crash. Um, it, if, it, if people wrote incorrect programs, it would just kind of operate as best as it could and just note where it was confused about the output. Um, and this made it extremely robust. Um, it also had the interesting principle that like, it was able to be used, for, for those who saw my panel yesterday, uh, it was able to be used by all kinds of really interesting people who wouldn't ordinarily consider themselves AI people. Um, this meant that we got a really wide range of um, 10,000 bots getting made, um, everything from sort of like interesting uh, critical theory bots, to like fart emoji generators, um, to hipster cocktail generators, uh, to the ever popular infinite screaming, uh, which participated in a conversation about interactive narrative this morning on Twitter. Um, so uh, I've, I've wanted for a long time to figure out like what's next in sort of my trace reverse, like what can I do next? Um, so th this, uh, this research is sort of partially funded by Google in that they, they hired me for 11 months to do prototyping for the Google Home. Um, and the Google Home was, uh, like you can look up how it operates, but it's mostly a sort of like, um, the writers get a response and then they offer what it, what it should say in response to that, uh, that query. Um, and that's not how actual conversations work. Most conversations are very, very, very state-based, or at least very context-based. Um, a lot of it's kind of loosely inspired by, uh, there's like something called the restaurant game, which is an online game that teleported uh, two players, one in the player, one in the role of a waiter, one in the role of a restaurant goer, and then they kind of had to negotiate how they were going to like do that encounter. Um, and the result of that work were that uh, people's operations in restaurants are like a very small, finite state machine um, with some kind of interesting behavior hanging off the edges. Like some people stacked up cheesecakes until they could stand on the roof, but mostly people were kind of operating on this like slightly branchy. Um, uh, finite state machine. I think some of Mark Ray Dell's work has gone into like more finite state machine conversational stuff. 
Um, so in the course of that work, I decided to make my own platform where I could like quickly prototype conversational chatbots with finite state machines. Um, and this turned into a project called Chancery. Um, it was originally called Bottery, but in the course of open sourcing it through Google, um, while we were still in the dark, somebody started a company named Bottery to also do a bot making platform. Um, so as much as I love the name Bottery, it has to be Chancery for now. I don't really feel like fighting. Um, and I'll talk more about our bot club in a moment. But yeah, I'm, I'm really about getting everybody to make bots because when four people make bots, the bots that we see are more interesting. It turns out like we're not actually currently gated on the technology as we think we are, we're gated on authorship. Um, so yeah, chance you a little bit about it. Um, the, uh, like it's, it's a finite state machine syntax. Um, it, you author in JSON or um, I'm building a, uh, a nice structural editor sort of scratch style such that people can't accidentally get into error because it's, it's, a, lot, it's a much more complex language than tracery, um, which is unfortunate. Um, it uses tracery for generative output, so even when you have a very simple state machine, it generates like new tracery utterances each time, which can be very uh, fun and interesting. Um, Google was kind enough to open source it. Um, you can play with it um, at a couple of different locations. I keep rewriting it uh, to try and make it simpler each time. Um, what it really is is you're authoring what I like to, the way I describe this to like non-computer scientists, because if you go up to most people and say, like, just author a finite state machine, um, this is not actually that helpful. Um, I used to refer to writing tracery, tracery grammars as like writing recipes or writing bad libs. That was more helpful than saying writing grammars. Um, kind of what Chris mentioned earlier about we often have like linguistic challenges to like know what I mean by a grammar is not like you know verbs and nouns uh, and something else. Um, and so I tell people like, it's like writing a board game. So you have a board game and you have a pointer on your board game, and you're not actually changing the board, but you're moving your pointer around it. And you might kind of have a little blackboard of information off to the side of like, here are all the cards that you currently have, or here's the current stack of money in Monopoly, or uh, you know, here, here's all the betrayal, or like here's all the, the omen cards that are currently stacked up in betrayal of the house and hill. Um, and I might even have multiple pointers that are operating. I might even have like maps within maps. Like betrayal of the house on the hill is really nice because you have pointers moving around a big map, and then each person is also has a couple of pointers moving around their mental map of like, you know, I'm I'm mentally like degrading as I go through this this house. And then there's also a kind of like tertiary map of like how far we are on the betrayal. Um, so you can kind of like make all these different kinds of maps. And they're, this works really well as a metaphor because I can tell people what do finite state machines represent? Uh, well, board games sometimes represent physical space, sometimes they represent mental space. Um, so like the game of shoots and ladders where you're kind of like moving through morality and there's a long history of Victorian board games that do that. Um, and then they can also represent like temporal space. If you played like the game of life, where there's one path of like going to grad school and there's one path of going directly into a career. Um, so you can kind of mapify a whole bunch of spaces. Um, another thing that just happened recently is um, I was awarded a grant through the Center for, Re Center for Research and Open Source Software at UC Santa Cruz, um, which if we can get the legal stuff ironed up, means that I can spend a year um, authoring what I'm gonna call arcbot.club, uh, which is kind of inspired by a glitch and scratch of uh, the idea is that it would be a, a I, I jokingly referred to this for several years of um, it's the a human free social network uh, that's not Google Plus. Uh, <laughs> and yes, yeah, so the idea would be that you would come here to visit, web, or visit interesting bots that people have built, either like bots that are characters, or bots that are jokes, or bots that are maybe like an adventure game. Um, you can kind of think of it as almost like a Twine style hosting site. Uh, but it's also inspired by Glitch and Scratch in that both of these, you can, you, you go in as kind of a visitor, and then you're invited to just maybe like go behind the scenes and look at something. Maybe make a couple of edits, maybe like create a new bot, and all of a sudden you're like one of the main bot authors on this platform. So it's kind of putting people on a little escalator into computational learning. Um, so pretty excited about that if, again, we can make it work out. Um, so yeah, uh, come to see it this afternoon. Um, I can show you like many different versions, including the latest version, um, and talk about, like hopefully it'll be similar to Tracery where uh, it's, I've been sort of cutting off all the tentacles so it's a nice little embeddable JavaScript module that doesn't demand anything of you. Um, but we'll see where that goes. Uh, I'd love to have more people try it out. So I don't uh, have slides, sorry, I didn't realize that was a thing. Um, so I will just speak to you all. Um, 
So I'm Aaron Reed. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Aaron Reed. I was formerly at UC Santa Cruz. I'm now working for a company called Spirit AI. Um, for about 15 years now, I've been making indie games, exploring interactive narrative in various ways. Um, I started out doing kind of text adventures, uh, ended up writing um, text adventures that were way too large, and then uh, moved on to uh, other ways to um, uh, write way too many words, um, including dissertation in the last <laughs> day. Um, uh, but what I've really been interested in for most of that time is exploring alternatives to sort of branch and path models of interactive story, what are more sculptural ways that players can feel involved in a dynamic story, what are more um, kind of social ways players might feel involved. I worked with Josh McCoy on the Prom Week uh, uh, a number of years ago now. Um, and uh, with Spirit AI, uh, this is a, a pretty recent uh, AI startup that's trying to create a platform for conversational NPCs in games. So uh, the company was started by some people uh, who had formerly worked on IBM Watson and were trying to build a platform based on that tech for better understanding player intent. We ended up pretty rapidly moving away from Watson to rolling our own system uh, that can incorporate more kind of contextual and um, uh, kind of domain-specific knowledge around storytelling and interactive storytelling. Um, but uh, our product character engine is designed to be sort of a tool that game makers can plug into their existing game that gives them a platform with natural language understanding, with a lot of contextual awareness, uh, with some text generation on the output side, and basically allows you to have a complete sort of um, pipeline you can treat as a black box where you send uh, what the player says in and get out what the NPC says back. Um, and from the perspective of the work being done here, a lot of what we're doing isn't technically very sort of newer groundbreaking and stuff that's existed for a number of years. But the cool thing from my perspective that we're doing is we're wrapping that up in a nice friendly package that game developers can kind of take off the shelf and use to get the kind of characters that we're interested in uh, in this community. Uh, into commercial games without those people having to go reinvent all those rules by themselves. Uh, so the playable experience that you'll be able to see tonight is um, a recent game uh, made by Emily Short, who's another people at Spirit AI and is very well known in the interactive story community, uh, that is actually not using natural language input, but is using um, dynamic menu input. So what the system is doing is rather than using its knowledge of what the player might be saying in any given moment to interpret uh, raw input, it's using that to give the player a list of things they might want to say at this moment. Uh, and what the demo uh, lets you do is change a lot of things about your emotional tone and the kind of topic you're interested in and watch those menu options dynamically keep changing until you find a set for the choice that you're interested in choosing. So it's a very interesting kind of nice hybrid between full um, natural language input and um, just having three options to choose from. Uh, this, um, if anyone remembers uh, the uh, our initial proposal for the playable experience that was submitted, this is actually a different game than that. Uh, for boring legal reasons, we ended up at the last minute not being able to show that game. But we have a different playable experience to show you instead. I uh, have a video clip of the game we were originally going to show that shows um, other kinds of input modalities. So um, you'll be able to check those out and ask me questions about how that all works. All right, just give me a second. Uh, talk about what's in the presentation layer first, and then I can talk to how it all comes together. 
So uh, for the presentation layer, we've created like multiple different locations that like consist of a market camp, and they're all like configurable, and you can kind of make one go to another. And then it's also made up of a bunch of customizable characters, which can vary in age, gender, shape, or color. And uh, so our intention here is like, if you run the presentation layer without anything, like it won't do anything, right? So it's just it's basically just uh, Apple graphics and doesn't do anything. But so the, the magic here is the logic that's going to be running up on a separate process. And so the separate process will be, if, if, so if like most of our like previous narrative uh, research, I guess, uh, was more text-based. So basically all the actions and everything that was done was done through text. And so we wanted more of this like visual co uh, context where like uh, we can get like human subjects to play a visual game versus like a text game. And so, uh, right, so everything is done via the console, the system terminal, and uh, as long as you can use like Java's system app.print for uh, C sharps, console.writeline, or Python's print, uh, you can interact with the, the API that we've created in our presentation layer. So, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there for now, but that's what I'm presenting. Yeah, thank you. I'm Terry Sewell, I'm from the University of Idaho.
Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all so, so very much uh, for those brilliant descriptions and you know, overcoming technical difficulties with a problem. Um, just to get the ball rolling, uh, so we all you know, describe our experiences, I thought we did a fantastic job of describing some of the overarching goals of your pieces. So, so the first question I'd like to ask all of us is, so in the, in the notion of AI-based game design, AI-driven game design, Oftentimes, there's this notion of the system, the AI system, and the game itself, and there are at once these distinct entities, but the development of one is intimately connected with the development of the other, and working on one informs the other, and vice versa. So I'm kind of curious if there's any standout moments in your development process that kind of like, where you're like, oh my gosh, like, this playable experience, like, absolutely would not have been what it was had it not been for this design choice AI system. And also, the other way around, oh, I want this, this feature to exist, but, like, the system just won't enable it. But, hey, I'm the designer system. I know that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not curious about any stories that you might have to share on that thing. Oh, sure. <laughs>
that more abstractly, where we're actually like trying to address AI deficiencies and gameplay deficiencies from past work in this work. Uh, in particular, in particular uh, this is sort of a response to the conflict between bottom-up uh, simulation-based character experiences and top-down, uh, more uh, author-driven or drama-managed experiences. Uh, we were trying to get more of a medium-term coherence where the characters felt good and the story felt good over more than just like 30 seconds of gameplay. Uh, so whether or not we achieve that goal, hopefully you can uh, let me know uh, during this session.
syntax is like you just type English um, as one of the rules, and it's perfectly fine just copying it below. And then you can do, you know, um, hashtag hello and replace that with thing. Um, and a lot of people actually stop there. Um, but there's also like modifiers and uh, push pop notes or push pop things, which almost nobody ever uses. Um, <laughs> and so I, uh, I was at a talk by Chris Martin a while back, um, and she said that like she uses a lot of sugared syntax for her work. Um, and syntactic sugar is kind of, you take, uh, there's a, a great uh, Alan Kay quotation of, I'm going to mangle this, but um, simple, or, uh, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. Um, so if you have something that users are doing all the building time, or especially if something that you're beginning users want to do, you kind of want to have a little bit of syntactic sugar that's just like, just do that thing. Um, and then you can kind of bash on that as much as they want. And then you can have a moment where you like unfold, like I kind of think of it as like unfolding boxes. So like you're unfolding that box into a slightly more complicated form of UI, and then they can do that thing with a modifier if they want, or that thing with a couple of parameters. And then you unfold that as like that thing with parameters and also a function, and also some like, you know, all, all the other like chats that you want. Um, what you don't want to do is do something like horrifying, like um, Unity Maya style, uh, very computer science like wall of controls, because um, that doesn't tell them what the most important thing is. Like you kind of want to do, like pretend you're making the idle game for your simulation. Um, how do you unfold those controls in order? Yeah, with the tools for the uh, work that I've done, it's always been this fight between uh, that you want a lot of contextual uh, behavior, a lot of complexity, but that has to be offered somehow, and we, you know, we want our authors to be able to interface with it. Uh, so I, uh, I'll be happy to show off some prototypes of some new uh, tool types that uh, we've been working on uh, during the session if you're interested. Uh, there's also work that we're doing right now with my uh, PhD student, Erica Gerardo, uh, that we uh, are looking uh, at visualization uh, theory and visualization conferences and seeing how their rules of thumb, their, uh, what their research shows about what visualization types help people understand which data, and using that for our you know, interactive narrative projects uh, for story understanding. So, uh, watch the space. One of the things we learned early on at Spirit AI is that natural language interface is actually terrible for a game. <laughs> <laughs> um, and because the space is so constrained, right, and a lot of Interaction is about usefully constraining the space, right? So um, other fields have figured this out, right? Like in improv theater, they don't allow the audience to participate in any way they want. They want, and they say, what would be a terrible place to go on vacation, right? It's a very constrained way of providing input into the scenario. Um, uh, and you know, there's a lot of other examples like that. So one of the things um, uh, as we evolved for both players playing one of our games and authors creating a game is providing much more framing about how to um, engage with that space in a productive way, right? So for authors, you don't want to just have to stare at a blank page and think what are, what's every possible thing a player could say in this game. You want to um, provide them tools like um, clustering things around uh, um, topics, clustering things around scenes, ways of approaching that. Similarly for players, there's a big sort of UI and design challenge in um, constructing a scenario such that your player understands what kinds of things will be fruitful to say, to talk about, to move the story forward. So um, that's a tooling issue, it's a game design issue, it's a building um, domain knowledge experience issue, right, when you're working in a space like that, um, but it's definitely a process. Uh, and it's for Camelot, uh, I guess we, we kind of have kind of two different audiences, so we have the actual the users that, that play the game, and then we have the, uh, the researchers that are making their systems that are intelligent, making intelligent NPCs. And so uh, for the users, yeah, I, I, we, we constrain that a lot. We basically, uh, the, the user just points and clicks in the world, and uh, maybe you might have a couple of actions to do. And uh, so, yeah, I believe that it, it's important to like constrain that for the, the, the user. But also for the author, uh, or, or the person making their system, I kind of wanted to make him a system that would uh, kind of serve everyone's needs. So, uh, like, it could be an interactive adventure, or it could be a linear story that you're showing on the screen. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard line to figure out. Like, how much do you how much do you constrain your domain, and how much do you like actually hold everything back? But uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of just trying to point out like what, what is good and what is bad. 
with AI as a whole is like actually pretty hard and a, a difficult thing to learn over time. Awesome, thank you. I, I just want to ask one more question and follow up on the story and then we'll open up the audience. So, speaking of creating this experience, experiences that like have things that are visible to your players, uh, many of you uh, were working in an interdisciplinary context with biologists, with testing services, uh, with, with, with artists um, who don't necessarily have computational backgrounds. And I'm, I'm curious, do you feel that by having a playable experience, it, it facilitated working in this inter interdisciplinary domain? Like, did it make that process like an easier one? Sure. Uh, so with this game, it was actually that interdisciplinary collaboration uh, was the first thing we thought of, and then we designed it with that constraint in mind. So it was sort of like the inverse problem, uh, but it was still a very hard problem. And uh, you know, training psychometricians and social scientists, psychologists to uh, be able to encode things in complicated AI systems, speak uh, even with tools and with reductions and encapsulations is still really difficult and you know, something that <laughs> we'll be working for a long time to, to try and solve that level of uh, communicating things, particularly in context, is the, the big one. When you find an error of what you're doing and it's there in the game, you know it's there, you pull it out, you have all this debug information and you want to make a tweak. Like, what is the relevant all of information around it? And calling that is
question, you have to like, you know, if they ask you as a question or if they ask you as a statement, if they ask like um, slightly different phrasings, you might want to like start your answer in a different way. Um, but they couldn't define any of them. Um, and so um, <coughs> learning that like writers hate it when you say just trust us because she will do it correctly uh, is bad. Um, and so I ended up, um, uh, this took a while, but on um, Chancery, the new model of how to write what it's going to listen for is to actually write a trace read grammar because I know that um, they can write that. And it, it cracked the hardest problem that they have, um, which, you know, this is after I was at Google, but the, there's a concept of the California negation. Um, do you want to go Do you want to go for lunch? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, no, yeah, no. Um, and this is actually very specifically captured by a grammar. <laughs> Yes or no, 
this is everyone, that we keep forgetting that it's actually one of the reasons that people enjoy our experiences. Um, sort of like, I can crack this like mystery or interaction um, if there is some sort of underlying system that I can know in a way that I can't know humans. Um, that's satisfying, and I don't know, yeah, I really don't know the, the natural, the pure natural language fuzziness. Um, what kind of satisfying being designed can take a lot of that? It's not just like a human conversation. Uh, natural language is, you know, to my mind, a reduction of the social, psychological, and internal complexities that we have. And without you know, having some approximation of that, natural language is going to be very hard to understand and parse and get the real intent of the textual perspective is. Let's take one more question. Yeah.